Hey there, lovely brainiacs of the interweb. Just wanted to give you a quick heads up before we get into the conversation proper with Dr. Tammy Chang. She is going to appear on the Rise Today inspirational podcast, uh, which always does a live recording feed for any who would like to be to witness that, be part of it. You can do a Q&A live through, through Facebook. What you do is go to Facebook and go to the Rise Today podcast. Uh, page on Facebook. Put a link to that in the show notes. That live uh, event is going to be April 19th at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That is 2 p.m. Central and uh, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. For those that live outside North America, I believe that is GMT minus eight. Greenwich Mean Time is eight hours ahead of Pacific Standard Time. So there you go. I believe that'd be 5 p.m. if you live in GMT, so adjust accordingly. As always, to view the video of this or any of our episodes, go to patreon.com slash broken brain, become a subscriber, and you can get access to that and also bonus materials. The Broken Brain. Uh, Dr. Chang, thank you so much for being here. Oh, I'm, well, thank you for having me. I'm super. I'm super excited. This happened as we were scheduling actually an interview for another podcast that I'm going to actually plug here casually, which is the Rise Today Inspirational Podcast, a show that I produce for Dr. Erica Harris. And so it'll be it'll be you know Dr. Tammy Chang without me. So whether or not you like this episode, you're gonna like her. So you know if whether or not you like the me part, you'll definitely like. I try that not podcast. to laugh. <laughs> So you're good. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about oh really we'll see a lot of things probably but we're gonna talk a little bit about physician burnout and some of those things. But why don't we start out by telling people a little bit about who you are? You uh, by the way, as a doctor and a trainer, you've got a wonderful website. Um, I, I don't know if I should qualify. A lot of people don't have good websites. <laughs> I got a lot of help. <laughs> I did not do it by myself. I'm all about asking for help. <laughs> it's very good as far as the information that you share and things. It's just, just it's a, it's a good site. So I was glad to see there. But tell everybody a little bit about yeah you know, where where do you come from and uh, career wise and just whatever you want to share. Sure, I'm a I'm a pediatric on- hematologist oncologist. That's my day job. I'm also the medical director of provider wellness for my healthcare system. So I do all this work around physician burnout every single day. And I still take care of patients. So I get to do honestly get the best of both worlds. And I get to do that. I I'm a coach. I'm a a professional executive leadership coach for physicians and I do wellness coaching. I'm also the co-founder of pink code MD with my med school classmate from Brown Louisa. That's a platform to help support women physicians and help them thrive. Keep us in medicine. Yeah. What else do I do? <laughs> I'm from the Pacific Northwest. I live outside Seattle. I grew up out here. I have two dogs, a husband. That's really the most important things in my life. We had ta- we had talked about pink a little bit. For those listening mm-hmm. to this audio format, they can't see, but there's pink pillows all over behind you, and I've got the pink, <laughs> I've got the pink microphone yeah, that people exactly. like to mention. So <laughs> we're good on that too. A very a lot of really interesting things that you mentioned. I guess your burnout work does correlate also with the awareness and the work that you do with women physicians too, because that's got to be yes, it's yeah. a risk for every medical professional, but I would imagine an enhanced risk for uh, uh, women clinicians. Yeah, significantly higher yeah. for women. Interesting, and we have quite a burnout crisis right now. In fact, um, we had a. Uh, 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 Jesse Waite on the program, Dr. Uh, Waite on the program a couple of weeks ago, he uh, was, in fact, he's uh, contributing our, our book for our first uh, Broken Brain book club that's coming up. Those of you who have been following that will know him, but there's he, he talked about computer-assisted therapies, but he mentioned that the burnout rate for psychotherapists, and he quoted a number of about 50% currently. Yeah. And wow. just now, as we were setting up, you were telling me like, oh, good news, it's worse. Wait. That's not how you phrased it, but it's uh, the rate's higher when you incorporate medical uh, professionals, right? Yeah, it's over 75% for physicians right now at the stage in the pandemic. Actually, nursing's even higher. It's in the upper 80%. Hmm. So it's 
it's the vast majority of healthcare workers. There's actually a, a really prominent headline that just came out in Forbes a couple of weeks ago that's kind of all over the news. 75% of healthcare workers are, are predicted to leave the workforce by 2025. Wow. Like to leave the the whole field, basically. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And not not just their jobs, but their entire career. Yeah. There it's it's Actually, I mean, it's very disturbing, obviously, but it's also been fascinating and disturbing to see people in jobs that are very specific identity jobs, teachers, uh, yeah. medical professionals. Those are usually jobs people get into because they want to be that thing, right? It's not just uh, by accident, yeah. usually, that someone lands in that. And to see those are also so they tend to be jobs that people retire from or they go into for a long time and can't picture themselves leaving. I mean, I was reading an online thing the other day that was comparing there it was a, this was about teachers, but there was a school where they listed all the teachers like 27 teachers that were leaving either mid-year or at the end wow. of that year. And it reminded me of like you hear about things like a like the Burger King walkout that made the news where the all the employees just mm-hmm. locked the Burger King and left to put up a sign said sorry, you can't get a burger here, there's nobody who works here anymore. It was schools. You know, and so, I mean, we're going to see that with schools and clinics, you know, Um, it's it's going to touch everybody's life, whether or not they want to talk about it. That's I think it's one of the few. Well, this maybe isn't a silver lining because I think the pandemic only heightened these issues. But a lot of these issues existed prior to the pandemic and they were just exacerbated really and brought to the forefront. Mm -hmm. So maybe the way I look at it is I always try I try to be glass half full. And think about what is the silver lining here? What mm. what can make us stronger as a result? I do think that one silver lining is that this is front and center. It's in every industry, but especially these, these are like basic necessity industries, right? Like these are the ones that didn't close down when the pandemic hit because yes. we kind of need them to keep our society going. Yeah. Like the work, like the police force, right? Mm-hmm. Law enforcement, healthcare education. Yeah. Yeah. These are the, and they're also the, I mean, not, not as much, I guess, at, at some, at a school, but there's 24 seven nature to this too, where there has to be someone aware and working all the time in these, in these fields. Right. And, and yeah. it's, Hospitals so it's never already close. demanding, right. It's already demanding yeah. <laughs> at the best of times. Yeah. We can't close a hospital really. I mean, hospitals do close, Sure. But who are people going to go for their when they're sick? Yeah, it, don't have absolutely. anywhere for them. Well, let's uh, we'll get into some of the reasons why, as you put it, some of them uh, predate obviously the pandemic and have been amplified. But first, I wanted to ask, what's a good definition of burnout? Obviously, I guess leaving one's whole career is <laughs> that, that would be a a pretty nuclear symptom, if you will. Nuclear symptom is that a term that I just made up? I don't Probably. know, but it it makes sense. I think. I mean. Well, it's you're you're talking about the heart of the, the driving force, right? Of whatever happened, the end result that happens, which is people quitting. Yeah. But yeah, I think well, with your background too, I I'm I like to go back to the data and go back to the clinical definition because there is one. It's the burnout occupational burnout is actually listed in the WHO mm-hmm. list of international diseases as of 2019. So there's three main components. It's just regardless of the industry. The first one is just exhaustion physical, emotional exhaustion. The next one is this depersonalization aspect. So that often shows up as compassion fatigue, especially in helping professions like healthcare and education, therapy, just like you do. And then the third one is a lack of personal accomplishment. So it feels like, what's the point? I've lost the complete meaning in this work. So there's actually three components that define burnout. And some are more expressed in some individuals and others it's it's individual to each person but those are the common themes interesting it's it's interesting that uh compensation is not one of those you're saying that's not a major contributing factor <laughs> well there are many drivers to I mean, not to say that it burnout. isn't right not to say that it isn't a factor <laughs> sure. but it's not the one of the primary ones isn't that that's kind of interesting well there there's a lot of data actually on least drivers and burnout in healthcare so I can't speak to other industries yeah. but I can speak to the data that's out there for healthcare and one of them is a lack of rewards mm-hmm. based on what's important to the individual. Yeah. So and that may not be money. Mm-hmm. I know there's been research in job fields for a long time that 
uh, if you if you know what's expected of you and you have the tools to do it, people will people will typically take a pay cut to have that if they don't have it in their current job. That's an old, that's just an old mm. job industry like stat um, that typically is. But at the same time, right now with inflation and things like that, it's becoming more of a as it becomes more pressing too. As you put it, yeah, it kind of depends on what the person values and or needs. I have a friend who is leaving the healthcare uh, for another career uh, currently, and he and I—he was a, a social worker, case manager in a yeah. in a large hospital system. And he made the comment to me: "He's like, you know, I see on the news where they'll say, you know, give us better compensation and life quality on the job. We don't just want another pizza party." And he said, "You know, while I agree with that a hundred percent." He's like, we got an email at one point that said, you're all doing so well in the pandemic. We're having a pizza party this Friday. And they didn't. They didn't even have it. So he's like, I, we didn't even get our pizza party. Oh, well, don't. There <laughs> so you go. Don't no promise what you there. can't deliver. Right. Don't don't promise what you can't deliver. Yeah. Too. That's always important. Yeah, exactly. There's an unfulfillment uh, there as well. And is that that would be one of those major things, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, there's it's it's complex and there's multi factors, but mm-hmm. one of them is compensation in the value metric of that's important to that individual. Yeah. Another one is actually work life flexibility, mm-hmm. which for a lot of at least positions we don't have that. We're book solid. I mean, certainly in the you're in the mental health field when you're in a clinic and you have a schedule, you kind of have to stick with the schedule, right? You don't you can't go take off in the middle of your day to go to the post office or the bank, right? right. Like you kind of have to do it. So there's those flex those issues. There's also also in healthcare, when we talk about healthcare itself, we actually now know that there eighty percent of burnout in healthcare is systemic systemic. Mm-hmm. So organizational. And only twenty percent is due to personal personal like personal resilience. So it's not because of a lack of personal resilience on the part of the individual. That's that's a really interesting thing because I do think when we're searching for reasons, we love to blame. Um and there is a mm-hmm. dynamic and I'll be a little dramatic, you can pivot away or towards this if you want um victim blaming let's call it that oh yeah <laughs> Someone, i and, think and it in is this case a victim of a condition right of burnout to say well i guess you couldn't hack it and I, I, maybe when the numbers weren't quite so high we could get away with that more and shame the individual <laughs> and now it well, doesn't work as well we can no. see through that well we've learned a lot which mm-hmm. is which is good. I, I think even five years ago, you would see healthcare organizations trying to roll out more yoga programs and meditation and counseling, which are all incredibly valuable. Don't get me wrong. I personally do yoga. I love yoga. It actually keeps me sane. Like it helps me in my well being and my self care, but it's not the only thing. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was kind of a lack of understanding and recognition of these systemic factors. But we know so much more now. So it's really changing the dynamic and the conversation nationally. Uh, there, there's sometimes there's been a lot of uh, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic kind of behaviors of like, hey, we have a little brown bag lunch. Everyone can meet and chat and improve morale. What are some of those things we've learned and are learning? That's a really great image, actually, metaphor of arranging the deck chairs on the Titanic because you're not fixing the problem, right? You're just maybe slowing down who's going to end up in the icy water, but at the end, it's still the same. <laughs> <laughs> overall end result. So, well, we've learned a lot. We're still learning, but we know 80% of burnout is due to organizational factors. Mm-hmm. And actually what we do know is that a lot of that comes down to two very main kind of big buckets. So, and this is actually based on the Stanford model of, of professional fulfillment for physicians. That's the work of Tate Shanafelt from Stanford. Mm-hmm. And we know that it comes down to efficiency of practice because healthcare has dramatically changed in the last ten, two decades and the rise of the electronic medical record. And that has become the largest pain point for the vast majority of physicians today. Really? Oh, yeah. And then the second one is actually a culture of wellness. And that is multifactorial. But within that is also the culture of your organization. Do they actually prioritize your well-being? Is that important to them? Do they actually follow through on things? Is it not, it's not just talk, right? They're actually trying to do things about it. Mm-hmm. The other piece is leadership. So we actually know that your one-up supervisor, at least in healthcare for physicians, directly impacts the well-being of physicians like significantly. I mean, it's actually remarkable how much so. Wow. And it's very simple. It's it's simple things like your your supervisor it, it kind of makes sense it's kind of common sense like you would every who doesn't want a boss who cares about you seems to care about you and your well-being okay. 
cares about you as a human being outside of work as well, and then cares about your development. Yeah. Right. And helping develop you in your career. I mean, those are the three of the three of the very high key points that are really important to physicians. It's not rocket science, right? right. But it's, it's these things, and not to mention just the, the flexibility. We talked about work-life integration, flexibility, and then there's also the whole concept of autonomy that physicians, or at least, are feeling less and less of mm-hmm. today in corporatized healthcare. Yeah, I know that. Uh... The idea of doing burnout prone behaviors is has almost been romanticized historically. And now I think with I see well, this is one of the things I actually admire. I work with a lot of young people and I admire that they actually are standing up for their rights in workplaces. That's becoming more mm. of a value, I think, of the population. But you know, there's that attitude of just I mean, medical school, right? Well, you torture interns, don't you? That's fun because you got tortured as an intern. I mean, that's the old school stereotypical attitude. Of, of, yeah, of like doctors. Grey's Anatomy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I mean, and I think you hit on, to me, this is what I'm most passionate about, which is the overall culture of medicine, period. Because it's not only what we have now, we're headed toward this big crisis and losing our workforce. But I'm also thinking like the next generation, right? What's going to, what are we doing for the next generation? And I love that you bring up the young people because I see that too. I, I work with a lot of mm-hmm. young medical students and pre-med students who are learning these words about they've heard of the word self-care before and prioritizing their their well-being and sleep. I mean, these are things that were foreign to me when I was in my 20s. So I see that change happening and I'm I'm hopeful that we can make a real change for them. Yeah. Do you feel like um well actually first of all I want to ask about uh, a little bit about the EMR before I forget that that's very interesting oh, sure. or the OMRs or whatever we say the online medical records and electronic medical medical it's easy for me to say the electronic medical records which <laughs> we call it EMR for a reason cuz yeah. it's hard to say all of that. <laughs> yeah it's it's something that promised to be life changing in a good way right and and it is interesting because I wonder, well, that, that what are some of the reasons why that's burning out physicians to have this uh, this thing that really was sold to the medical community as, hey, we can read all everyone's notes really fast. You can just turn, click a few keys, whatever. Um, what's burning people out about that? I, I think there are a lot of wonderful things about it. And I, I do think it's safer care. And ultimately, that should be our priority. The problem is that I think it's it's complex again. But if we're talking about physicians, and this is not just physicians, it's everyone using the EMR, but physicians are trained to practice medicine and document in a way that doesn't fit today's EMR reality. So we were taught to write very long, thorough, complete notes with a whole long differential. We're taught a way to document, actually, that's honestly, we do it to ourselves. We don't know any other way. And we've done this for decades, right? And I'm, I'm on the younger side. I'm in my 40s. So I'm I'm not someone in my 60s learning to use the EMR after practicing for 30 years, right? It's much harder, I think, for those who've been doing a certain way for a long time. So there's already just the mindset and the approach to documenting a patient's note or the chart it gets longer and longer and longer. Yeah. There's also lack of disconnection from work. So people take their work home now because I mean, then that's the other, it's a wonderful part of being able to work remotely or take your work and be able to do it from a comfortable space. But then we have physicians and APPs, advanced practice practitioners, honestly, who are charting every night and on the weekends. They're getting so behind that they're charting on their vacation time, right? I mean, it just takes over and there's no separation and no wonder people are burning out, right? So there's that piece as well. And I think the last piece is that there is a way for patients to message us directly. And unfortunately, it's getting longer and longer and longer. Systems don't have time blocked out so that physicians and APPs can actually respond to those messages. It's like added work on top of everything else throughout the day. And so that's actually become a huge burden for a lot of practitioners today, too. Yeah, there's uh, traditionally been kind of a barrier a gatekeeper there to say you got to talk to the nurse first. And a lot of still have something there, but... 
Uh, especially one of the tricky things, even like with pediatrics as a parent, is you have questions you're going to answer tonight, and who do I talk to? And it's interesting because I saw a trend to say, well, there's a nurse or somebody on call who who actually can give, and that's their whole job, their whole shift. And But mm-hmm. as you put it, I think along with compassion fatigue, there's there's sometimes knee-jerk compassion that crosses a line to the point like like as a physician and I well let me put it this way I only know my experience as a therapist uh, because in private practice a lot of times there's ways people you know they're through my practice email or or phone or whatever people uh, leave a message or do this and I, I kind of feel bad if I can't get back to them right away or you know there's that kind of a thing of like oh absolutely you know, they need to know this or whatever you know that's that, although my clients out there will say gee i didn't hear from you right away um i also <laughs> adhd plus sure. your role there two guys but <laughs> as far as uh, uh things like that i think there's a burnout that i can see where that contributes you know i personally i've seen people lose their jobs for emr reasons um mm. because they couldn't adapt to it and I know in agencies I've worked in, that was always tied to the the billing as well. It so is. Well, that. and exactly. It's completely tied to billing. And so if you don't finish your billing. You get you, fired. You get fired. <laughs> you don't get, that is, that's how our systems get paid. So yeah. I, I think you, you bring up a really good point, which is that compassion piece. And again, I think it's the, it's the culture in which we've been trained, which is to be always giving. We put our patients first we always go above and beyond. It's expected to be a good medical student, trainee, intern, resident, et cetera. You, you put, you do everything for the patient. And so there's that drive that is honestly, I think within a lot of, a lot of practitioners and still in there and they, they want to do that. And it's, it's an extra struggle to say no. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also it goes with that charting as well, because you want something to be useful when someone pulls it up and, and if people aren't, a fast writer, or they're not as adept with the technology, there's that time that's like, oh, we give you a certain amount of time. You can go work from home and ruins. And like you say, it sounds good. But if I'm someone who takes, you know, uh, now I'm at home and I can stay up till midnight and I'm going to actually try to make good notes that I don't have the, oh, well, I got to leave at six. And so let me, let me do some. And the skill of learning things that are good enough to get me out the door and they're going to give all the information that's necessary. I, you know, I'm going to struggle more with that, especially if you're someone like I just mentioned with distractibility issues or time blindness, like some of us are, it's going to Mm -hmm. be like easy to just uh, let that eat it up. The, the positive cultural changes, uh, when you come in and, and look at a culture, what do you look for? You mean in general or or specific to the EMR? Uh, no, just in general, like we, yeah, mm-hmm. when you, you come in, let's say, cause you do uh, corporate level trainings, right? Where you come in and look at a company and say, do y'all have a good culture? I actually work within our system to do that. And so it's my job to create that, help, be, help create that culture. So I get to work from, I get to see it from the, honestly, the nitty gritty from the inside out, which to me has been in an invaluable experience. I've been doing this about a year. So it's, it's not just me, it's multi-level. I actually think the most important part comes down to having your leadership of your system on board and not only just seeing it, but being part of that solution. Mm-hmm. Because if they're, if it's not coming from them, it, no one's going to take it seriously. Change isn't really going to happen. It's not going to trickle down to all the different levels. If we're talking about it. We can, it could be a big organization. We've got 20,000 employees in ours. Could be a smaller one. It could be a you know, maybe a 50 bed hospital, right? A community hospital, rural hospital. The, the, the concepts are the same. If the people in charge aren't setting the tone and putting wellness and well being of the employees up front and center, then it's not going to trickle down to the bottom. So I think that that ultimately is the most important piece to start with. Interesting. What, what are some of the effects of burnout? I'm thinking about, we mentioned the big one, which is people leaving. Um, but there's also the risk of practicing worse for the, for any uh-huh. of us who don't leave the field uh, and making errors, mistakes, those types of things. What 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 kinds of things do you see as real risks there? We know that when you have a if you're being taken care of by a burned out physician, which is over seventy five percent of physicians today, you're at a six times higher risk of experiencing a medical error. That's no joke. 
right? I mean, so I'm so passionate about this because I, of course, care about my colleagues. I care about my profession. I'm a physician myself, so I'm biased from that perspective. But at the end of the day, to me, this is about the care we provide for our patients and our communities. And if we're not okay, we're not taking good care of anybody, right? Like, and it trickles, it trickles down and we're already headed toward a physician shortage. Prior to the pandemic, it was predicted that we were already going to be 130,000 in the hole, not enough physicians by 2033. Now it's going to be much worse. So think- who's, gonna, who's gonna take care of us yeah. <laughs> when we get sick? Who's gonna take care of our loved ones, right? And we don't want just anyone taking care of our loved ones. We want good, good clinicians, good nurses too. I mean, we want good people and all of healthcare taking care of people. Yeah, the population's aging as well. Obviously, we've got the biggest yeah. aging population, right, that we ever have. And so that's tricky. Also, it occurred to me when we talk about leadership and supervisors. One of the challenges there is that if I'm in the 76% of burnout people, my boss probably is too. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean that's what that's what statistical majority means. It means probably, right? <laughs> yeah. It's true. Leader burnout is real too, even non non clinicians. You look at our executive leaders, who isn't burnt out? I mean, well, who, how could anyone not be after what we've been through for the last two years? Mid-level supervision and mid-level oh, management is already hard in any industry, but particularly in medical, because a lot of times the first the first stages of mid-level management are, hey, you take over this team of people and we'll bump you up a hundred bucks a month or whatever. I mean, not not to yeah. make it once again, not to make it all about the money part, but the recognition and just the opportunities oftentimes are are not really there, and then. If you work, when I worked in community mental health, if you have Medicaid documentation requirements, and we also were at a point where we were the agency of the in the county that we weren't allowed to turn away people, As, even if yeah. we were full and didn't have enough clinicians. Legally, there was a you have to accept people, and then you're providing care with a skeleton crew eventually. You know, no matter how big your crew is, if there's enough patients, um, there's not other, and then there's not as much incentive for people to get involved. And come into the field if it's difficult and that. So yeah, where do you mentioned silver lining and you're obviously I, I can tell just by talking with you, you're a very positive person. Because even when I say, Oh, this is bad, the way that you phrase it is very much like looking for hope. And I, I think that's what we need is people with hope. Um, what kind of things do you bring? Are you hopeful to see uh, as far as solutions? Uh, to me, it's not just about one particular population of a healthcare system. It's about every single individual because we are, as you know so well in your work, we're so interconnected. And so we're seeing levels of burnout in our medical assistants, right? Our LPNs, not so non-nurses, technicians, front, front and back office staff, secretaries, people who do scheduling. I mean, these are all essential people to for the running of any healthcare system I, or hospital or a clinic, right? I think everybody probably has this uh, experience, which in Every major and minor medical service I've worked, uh, I've spent more minutes with those folks than I have with my MD, right? Because you're Absolutely. you're going from person to person to do the absolute. I think of my kids being born, and um, although mm. we had a wonderful OB who spent quite a while with us with our youngest uh, being born, I don't know that she still would be born if she hadn't have said, "Let's get this." You know, she was very very helpful and went above and beyond what an MD usually does as far as presence. But even then, it's like, you know, you're, you're in the hospital for hours and hours and hours, and all the people you mentioned are the ones taking care of you until it's like, time, we need the doctor, get in here, you know. So that's important. So I, to me, it's about building that culture of wellness for every single individual in the system. So I'm, I'm involved in taking care of providers. So that's physicians and advanced practice practitioners. But I, I see that in every single employee, like over 20,000 person system for an example. So the pro- programs and the systems that we're putting in place, I want that for everyone ultimately, because it's not, it, it's only going to get us so far to only focus on one part. Yeah. Wow. So overall hope, <laughs> do we have reason to hope? Uh, 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 I, I hope we always do hope for hope, I guess. Is that a good way to say? Well, I think the other piece too, is who are we without hope? Right. I mean, what is the purpose? I mean, what <laughs> I think we all need hope as a human human species. And if we have to come out of this time with hope, I mean, we're at such a, a dark time, right, in our mm-hmm. society, in our, our world. And 
not this is outside the pandemic now we're coming out of the pandemic we hope so we have to focus on hope because if we get stuck down there in the the sorrow which there is so much sorrow um, we have to recognize it and acknowledge it but we also have to be building and looking forward at the same time what do you tell people on an individual basis when you work with physicians uh, what do you tell them as far as that goes with hope how can they I, maintain? Yeah. It? Well, I actually break, I really simplify it down and help them to recognize mm-hmm. this is my work as a coach. And it's what, mm-hmm. what changed my life so much as a, working with a coach was like, what, what is, what does hope and meaning look like for them? What's most important for that individual? Because it's different for every single one of us and what are, what brings us meaning, what our values are, what our purpose, like our why with a capital W is so individual. And the vast majority of people have not been given the opportunity to really slow down and really explore that and define that clearly. And that's actually the very first thing I do with pretty much every physician, whether they come to me for leadership training or coaching or burnout or just distress in general, we start there because that it has to be, it has to come from that place everything that we do. And that's honestly, I think the birthplace of hope, which is having a true strong understanding of who we are and what we stand for and what brings us hope. Mm -hmm. It's, it's an interesting thing to look at uh, with, with the internal uh, personalization, knowing ourselves and saying, what is it that I'm hoping to gain? Um, Well, for my day-to-day life, because you talk about a work-life integration, you know, and usually people go into something like this once again for there's an identity component. There's like, this is me. I'm here to help. And it's no coincidence that I think most of the factors you mentioned, right? Exhaustion, compassion, fatigue, lack of accomplishment, and then the work-life balance. All of those are things that interfere with my ability to help. I can't help as much if I'm dozing off, right? No. I can't help as much if no. I can't accomplish my goals. Yeah. And th- I don't know if you've heard this other phrase, at least in the healthcare community, a lot of people don't call it burnout. They call it moral injury. Have you heard this phrase? I haven't. That's interesting. Yeah. I think that is at the heart for a lot of physicians. And I'm so glad you brought up, brought up this piece about identity because I think certain professions, they are, they're who they are is so wrapped up as this identity. And I think in particular in the United States, I, I'm starting to learn a little bit more about the cultures around physicians around the world. And it is quite different. It's not the same everywhere, but here, especially in the United States, it's like, there's, there's this, there's a perception of what a physician is supposed to be or who, who, you know, whatever it's supposed to be something. And that is so tied into us as individuals. And we've been that we've honestly been probably working as physicians. We've been trying to get there for since we were kids, it all started when we were teenagers, we had to excel to get to the stage in our careers. So I, I'm so grateful that you brought up that identity piece, because I think that is yet another driver of this mm-hmm. burnout, the moral injury piece being, we can't help because we're spending so much time in front of our computers and struggling with insurance companies to get the basics of care approved for our patients, doing the right thing for our patients. We're not spending that time. We're not, we want to be actually, we're but we don't, we're not able to because of the reality of the healthcare system and how much time we're allotted per patient, like the OB who spent time with you and your child when your, your kid was born. I mean, that's the kind of stuff we want to do. That's why we went into medicine. And yet a lot of us don't have that time in our day. We're only allotted 10, 15 minutes per patient. Yeah. yeah. And you, you look at that type of interruption. So you mentioned expectations that, that are part of the culture. I'm a doctor. It's supposed to be this or whatever. Um, what do you see? Do you see any particularly destructive expectations? I, I have a friend who likes to say that uh, expectations are just premeditated resentments, whether they're in relationships <laughs> or your career, yeah, whatever. Um, but true. when we're handed expectations, yeah, then it can be kind of bad. Well, I, I this is why I think this is such a driver of the mental health crisis that we have among healthcare workers today and especially physicians. And one in five physicians has considered suicide in their life and career. Physicians have the highest rate of suicide of any profession. 
even over law, law enforcement. I mean, I know this because this is my world. Sure. <laughs> and women physicians have as much as of a 400% higher risk of dying by suicide than women in the general population. Wow. And I'm so passionate about this. And I, I share this in my book that I just came out with because I myself was so severely burnt out that I was suicidal. And there is so much stigma in particular for physicians around any sign of weakness, because again, that identity, that perception, the expectations of the public that, oh, when I go see a physician, they're there to help me, right? Which is what I, when I go to see my doctor, yes, I'm there to get help from my doctor, but our physicians are human beings too, and struggle. And I think they're, they struggle, they struggle 10 times more to get help with that stigma of depression, anxiety, the things that are honestly human. Yeah. I see that, you know, in, in my field, there is at, at the same time, there's that expectation to be more than human, both. Sometimes it comes down from administration. Even I was really shocked yeah. when I've worked for some agencies that supposedly were all highly trained in human psychology and what makes people tick and yet can be very draconian to any sign of weakness or anything. Um, I've known clinicians who are afraid to tell their bosses in a mental health agency that they essentially, yeah, I've missed some work because I'm depressed. And in fact, uh, have even, I, I've known a couple who even exaggerated other illness when really depression was the problem because they're afraid, oh, if they yeah. know I'm chronically depressed, they're going to watch, I'll be in the next round of cuts, you know? Um, and that's a bunch of therapists, right? So that, that can be really, uh, really tricky. At the same time, I know that in my field, Often you see people who join the field because of personal experience. Either they've struggled with addiction, so they go into being an addiction specialist, or yeah. they have mental illness, So oftentimes even undiagnosed. I've talked about it on the program. I was a therapist, at, you know, it's an embarrassingly recent diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Um, mm. You know, and, and so there's a lot of that crossover you know, and, and I guess, I don't know if you see the same thing in physicians, there's not a good way to quantify that because everybody goes to the doctor for, <laughs> you know, for everything, <laughs> right. For everything. But there yeah. is oftentimes that piece that's like, oh, I know how I was helped and I want to do that too. And, and if I was helped by someone who is a bulletproof superhuman, then that's what I have to be. Hmm. So like a prior experience with a physician who seemed superhuman. Sure. Because from the outside, we all know that physicians are, you know, super healthy, well-adjusted, rich. There's all these things that we believe they are if we're not in, plugged into the medical field. They're right? like none of those things. <laughs> right. We have like, like the worst like... health of anyone. <laughs> we take horrible care of ourselves. We're the worst patients. <laughs> right. Fatigued, right? Uh, you know, and, he, and I, well, I, I believe... Even uh, even with the, the money factor, you know, that's one of the I know a lot of young people who are like, well, I'd like to be a doctor, but I don't want to get 300 grand in debt. I, I'm really scared of that. You know, at that the point. average the average physician comes out of medical school with close to 250 to 300 K of debt. Yeah. Yeah. And I think people it's don't not realize that we spend the rest of our lives trying to pay it off, actually. Yeah. Like it takes a couple decades. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, that's so there's that perception that I, I could see where that really, really can can damage the and make it hard I and mean, make it hard to to push through that because um, it's a big risk and it's a big work. Um, the other thing too, it's it's almost almost like well, we talk a lot about this on this show of how our weaknesses are also our superpowers and our superpowers are also our mm-hmm. weaknesses, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the, a lot of people have heard Sharon Blady who comes on the show quite a bit talking about that that model of living our lives. And uh, at, so at the same time, I can see where there's that flip side of hope because the same reasons for burnout are the reasons that people don't want to leave. There's a reason, you know, th- those that even moral those that crisis, living, right? Yeah. Moral injury. I'm telling you, it, like you said, again, it's physicians don't want to quit. They don't want to yeah. quit their jobs. I mean, they've spent decades trying to get here, yeah. right? They've given up their lives to get here. And so if there is another way to make it better, I mean, I can't tell you the number of physicians I know who are just grateful for coaching or mental health support, all the different yeah. resources that we've been able to create for them internally and externally to help them keep their job really. And to not only just survive, right, but to thrive. That's the goal for every single one of us. Yeah. So for physicians, there's some things you mentioned, which is get some counseling, get some therapy. 
Uh, I know consultation is big for those of us like I'm in private practice. I have a little group of clinicians that we will, you know, share with each other, like ask for feedback or help when it comes, of, especially when we're dealing with things, you know, I'll get a call or make a call to a colleague and say, hey, oh, you know, I'm thinking of referring this patient. I don't know if I'm the best for them. Uh, let's get some feedback or I'm not sure how to address this problem or something you would just walk down the hall if you had an agency around you. So making some of those efforts to take care of ourselves and make sure we're, we're safe and balanced. I, mm-hmm. I don't even know if this is a good question, so feel free to tell me it's not. Is there anything, those of us out here, those those people that out there that are not connected with the medical industry, are there, because it's everybody's problem, is there anything mm-hmm. that they can do other than, I guess, be nice to your doctor? <laughs> no, I appreciate that so much, too. I think just recognizing that Every single one of us are, we're all human beings doing the best we can. And I think that goes for physicians. It goes for, for leaders, right? People who are in leadership positions often get a lot of brunt of complaints, but they're just doing the best they can too as human beings. So I think it's just having that compassion for each other and awareness that the reality is every single one of us are human beings and we're, we have to take care of ourselves and each other. And so that plays into a little bit of the expectation piece you said when, when, when a patient might be uh, frustrated that something hasn't been done quickly, et cetera, yet it's, it's usually not because of the lack of desire on the part of the physician. They're probably extremely burnt out mm-hmm. and they might not have very much help to get it done. And it's hard. I think the, the divide has always been there to where if I'm seeing someone for any aspect of my health, for me, it's significant. This is like maybe right. even one of the most significant days of my entire life. And for them, it's like, one of however many people, as you put it, 10 to 15 minute chunks with a million people that I have to see today no. who are all having that experience. And so it's Wednesday, right, for you or, or whatever is you have to go through. And no matter how caring you can be, um, that that is a divide right there, I think. And all of us acknowledging that and, and saying like, OK, we're all working together. It strikes me from your comment um how much that's that's a there's a cognitive reframe that oftentimes we use in therapy, which is trying to look at people in our lives and say, if I assume that they do care for me and they're there to help me, um, you know, what would be another reason? Oh, that that didn't work out. Oh, that's because they hate me or they suck. Or well, maybe it's a different reason. And sometimes we can just get through the day happier if we say they're probably busy. They're probably having a hard time. Uh, once again, that's not that's this is not a. a this is not a bid against self-advocacy, but because the, there is such a Absolutely. thing as neglect, obviously. Um, I agree, yeah. Lest anyone misunderstand me. But the idea that, oh, well, if I call them back and try, if there's an appointment, shuffle. Because we're talking about office staff as well. And, mm-hmm. you know, if I can't get through on the phone, it's not because they're screening all their calls and they hate me. Um, it's probably because there's a million calls, you know. And so. Or they might not. They might have. We've we've had significant staff shortages, maybe. Mm-hmm. We're just, we're functioning with, I think, I think there's that one, that one sign that's been all over the internet, which is the the whole world is short staffed. Please be, please be kind. Right. We're just doing, everyone's just doing the best they can. And honestly, believe me, us as staff and physicians, we get it too. We want to get back as quickly as possible because we know this is significant for every single person. I'm a, I'm a pediatric oncologist. So I think that is even sometimes even more extreme. I get it. Like (laughs) this is your baby and I'm involved in taking care of you and you're, your family. And this is the most important thing in your world. So I get that too. And believe me, that's, that's a big driver of why I think we all care so much and ultimately can overdo it and, Mm -hmm. and harm ourselves in the process. So it's a balance there. Yeah. Working with the terminal and cancer situations with children, that's probably a pretty risky burnout scenario there. I also think that that's what makes it so meaningful and it gives it that depth of it's a reward that it's it's worth doing a million times over, but we have to take care of ourselves in the process. Yeah. Well, exactly. It's like that's this the superpower weakness, right? The same thing that burns you out mm-hmm. is one, the reason why you can persevere. Um, I always like to ask everybody who comes on the show uh, where we can find them and what their work is. But I also like to spring a question on them uh, about if you have any nonprofits or charities or things that are near and dear to your heart uh, and your life. It does not need to be related to what we're talking about, uh, but it can be certainly. 
Uh, do you have any of those uh, to put out there for people and say they ought to be checking them out? Can I say three? Yeah, certainly. Is you that too say, many? <laughs> you say as many. I mean, as you I have want. many more, but I, I think from the pediatric oncology side, there are two organizations that I are near and dear to my heart. Well, okay, I'm going to keep adding more. I'll just try to keep it to three. I'll just do three. How about I do three? Well, to, the purpose of today's was really about. Okay, I'll do three. <laughs> do three. Do it. I'll do three. One is the Make a Wish Foundation. I think they do incredible work, and I'm so deeply grateful for the work they do. They truly do bring a spot of joy to families with children who have life threatening illnesses or just serious illnesses. They don't have to be life threatening, and it, it makes them forget about their illness just for a little bit, right? And that is priceless. So the Make a Wish Foundation. Then the second one is the Serious Fun Network. So one of the things that I've loved the most, which thankfully is opening up again because the pandemic is hopefully, fingers crossed, getting better. It's been closed down for a couple of years. Uh, there are a series of camps founded by Paul Newman back in the 80s. They're all over the world now, but we have a whole bunch in the United States that provide essentially a camp experience for children with serious illness. And it is so well done. And I, so I volunteered as a cancer camp doctor for over 10 years at Roundup River Ranch in Colorado, which is one of the, the Series Fund Network camps. So just a wonderful, also nonprofit. They're completely function on volunteer and donor support. And so I, of course, always support both those organizations every year. And the third one is the Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation, who just helped to pass the Lorna Breen Healthcare Heroes Act, was just signed by President Biden within the last couple of weeks, which essentially um, ensures that healthcare organizations across the country have to provide mental health support for their employees. Oh, so, that's, am that's amazing. I hadn't, I wasn't as familiar with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just passed. And there's a lot more to this. There's also fund grant funding for initiatives and grants to increase not only support, but also education within healthcare systems. So that's a huge, huge win for, for that, the family that created that in the honor of um, the, their, uh, it was a sister and sister-in-law of the husband and wife who helped found that foundation. They're incredible. Corey and Jen, Jennifer Feist. And uh, she actually took her life. She's an ER physician, took her life at the beginning of the pandemic. Okay. Yeah. This is a real thing that you're seeing. You get a lot of the ones that you focus on too are about children, obviously. Why did you, how come you, if you don't mind my asking here at the end, how yeah. come you uh, picked pediatrics? Oh, it's, uh, I think I did four days of pediatrics and then decided I already knew I had to do it. It just felt, it's like in your gut. I mean, nothing else had brought me that much joy and life all at once. And it's so funny because I was actually halfway through my fourth year of medical school and I had so many people say, oh, I thought you were going into pediatrics. And I was like, no, I thought I was going to hate it. <laughs> I can't stand screaming children. And then I was like, I love it. <laughs> so I think others could see it before I could even. Okay. Some, something they, they, they picked up on. Isn't that funny? Yeah. 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 Well, tell people about uh, where can they find you? You know, tell them about your work. Where where can we get your book? That's the best place for us to get it for you. <laughs> I always like to ask. Oh, that, sure. Different outlets yeah. or different reimbursement. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it doesn't really doesn't matter to me. I I want it to just get out, get it out there. So it's like it's just easiest on Amazon. It's called Boundaries for Women Physicians: Love Your Life and Career in Medicine. Just came out, and it's for women physicians and of all about setting healthy boundaries in our lives because that's not something we learn about in our career or in our upbringing, honestly. Yeah. And so that's on Amazon. There's a Kindle and a, a paperback, and I'm coming out with an audiobook in the next next oh, few wow. weeks. And then my website is www.tammychangmd.com, i.e., and then I also have pinkcoatmd.com as well. well. Say that one again. I think it blipped just a little bit. Oh, www.pinkcoatmd.com. Very good. And a big, huge pink umbrella on the landing page for your website. Very oh, good. yeah. I like it. <laughs> it brings, you know, joy is my top first. Uh, it's my top core value. So it brings me joy when I see happy, bright colors. So that's part of, that's the main reason why. Dr. Chang, thank you again for being here. Thank you so much for having me.
Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court and Parts shows, visit courtemparts.com.